go to bed, it doesn't sleep. It's keep cranking every second of every day. And why you, you want to know why it's hard for people to get out of debt? It's because that interest is, is high. It's hard to get out of it. So as soon as you get into it, it's like that tar baby, you know? You stick your hands on it and you try to get out of it. And every time every you touch, you just get more and more involved in it. What was the name of that story? I can't remember. Rare rabbit, you know? You just get stuck in there and you can't get out of it. All right, well, let's talk about some people who've been really good at making and keeping their money. And I'm going to actually share some names with you that in the press, if you were to ask them whether they were, you know, good or good people or not, you probably have some real mixed reactions because the press kind of guides the way we think about wealthy people. But I like to look at the results of what wealthy people create. And that's what I think is wealthy. To create wealth, to be able to control it well enough, to be able to create a constant pool of, of cash that, that blesses generations of people. That's what I would call a, a good definition of wealth. And so as I look in the, in the dictionary, actually I look in the encyclopedia, under the word foundation, and a foundation is a legal entity you can set up to have your money bless people thereafter, you know, based upon the rules of your foundation. So you look at the, the largest foundations on, uh, in the world, and what are some of the names you're probably going to see on those foundations? You're going to see Rockefeller, which is synonymous with the word. You're going to see Ford. you see Carnegie. you going to see Kennedy. You bet. you see Mellon. Reynolds, you're going to see, you see every one of these people kind of set up foundations so that when they're gone, the money's still there. It's still cranking out and it's blessing millions of people. And I would dare say that everybody in this room, every one of you, has been directly and specifically blessed as a result of the money of some people you probably don't like all that much, frankly. Uh, the money that for disease research that's been spent over the last hundred years on uh, diseases and uh, all kinds of things. Uh, your life has been prolonged directly. Take Carnegie, for instance. When he, when he died, he says it's a, it's a sin to die with money, basically. So his, what he called the gospel of wealth, was he created a huge net worth, $600, $800 million. By the time he died, and I think it was 1915, he had managed to give it all away. He said, if I die with any money, that's going to be the greatest disgrace of my life. And what he did is he gave it away to various communities throughout North America and started their, their libraries. And folks, in fact, there are over 2,000 different communities in this country and in North America and Canada have libraries called the Carnegie Library. He funded the library, built the library, put books inside it, and gave it to, uh, a process so that it could continue to fund, fund itself. And so there's not a person in this room, not, not one single last one of you, that hasn't received that kind of benefit from these kinds of fortunes. But, you know, they always, we always have this, um, this underlying uneasiness about great fortunes. Well, let's take Rockefeller, for instance. If you read the newspaper uh, accounts of Rockefeller at the turn of the century, you'd find that Rockefeller and, and uh, no, it was actually, wasn't it Kennedy and Carnegie had this big battle to see how much, they, much money they could give away each year, and they were in a real competition to see which one could give the most amount of money away. Or was it Kennedy and Rockefeller? I can't remember which it was. But if you were to look at the, the, um, the these you know, real wealthy people back in the 1800s and 1900s, they call them robber barons. And the press vilifies them. It just absolutely destroys them. But when you look at their lives, you know, you find out that the way they treat and teach their, their own personal kids uh, was really much different, I think, than the way you read in the press. Uh, you look at Rockefeller's own life, and right from the very beginning, he kept, kept a ledger of all his money. Right from the very, very beginnings. And 10% of every dollar he got from the very tiniest beginnings to when it reached massive proportions always went to support his universe causes or God or charity or, or uh, tithing. He, he used the word tithing. And he taught his kids that way. Um, here's a quote that I put out of a book called Kids and Cash. And in it, there's some real good gems in here. In fact, I think what I call five Rockefeller rules that I think everybody should be taught. Uh, you may, may disagree with his politics. You may disagree with the way in which he earned it. But I'll tell you, there are some principles in there that are really critical to creating it. And I think it's written in there. You can kind of read along with me if you want to. John D. Rockefeller, Jr. This is the son of the, the John D. that started Standard Oil. So this is his son who was also a great philanthropist. 
was certainly not trying to save money when he decided to pay an allowance to his five sons. These five sons were the grandsons of the original John D. Rockefeller. According to his son Nelson, we got 25 cents a week, this is probably back in the Depression, and had to earn the rest of the money we got. Had to earn the rest of the money we got. Hmm. To earn part of that extra money, he raised vegetables and rabbits. We always worked, according to Nelson. All the boys were required to give 10% of the income to charity, to save 10%, and to account for all the rest. They had to balance their account books every month and to be able to tell what happened to every penny that they earned. Nelson went on to serve as governor of the state of New York for five, many years and all became the vice president of the United States. And one of his brothers, David, chairman of the Chase Manhattan Bank, says, We all profited by the experience, especially when it came to understanding the... Value. value of money. In other words, he, he had five specific rules to teach his kids the value of money. And I don't know if the great-great-great-grandkids have got that yet. They just probably ended up with their trust funds, you know. You're a Rockefeller grandkid, here's your trust fund from great-granddad. But the, but the son taught his sons this way, and I wish everybody in America was taught that way. What are the, what are the five rules that, that he taught you right there? Five rules. Yeah, right off the top, before you, you had to earn the money. But as soon as you went to go spend it, the first 10% went to charity or tithing. The second 10% went to savings. Then what were the other rules? You had to account for any penny. And what was the final rule? You had to, you had to balance your, your accounts every month. You had to balance them every single month. Number one, you had to work for it. Number two, you gave the first amount of charity, the second amount to yourself, the third amount you had to, to, to uh, account for every penny, and then you had to balance.